We're continuing this summer worship series from 1st and 2nd Kings in the Old Testament. And now that Elijah uh, has been taken up into heaven, Elisha, his successor in ministry, uh, continues what Elijah has been doing. He follows in his footsteps. The word of the Lord continues to be spoken. So now in our story today, we hear about Naaman, who is a mighty military leader, but he's affected with leprosy. So this little servant girl urges Naaman to go to the prophet Elisha to be healed. It's a a, kind of a wonderful example story of Israel bringing blessing to the nations. I mean, the people of God are to be a blessing to others in the world, bringing God's peace, that is God's Um, Shalom, God's wholeness and completeness of life, health and well-being, healing, joy and and beauty and justice and salvation. Hear these words now. We're in 2 Kings in the 5th chapter. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now, the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said, and the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel." He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, Wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Please accept a present from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives whom I serve, I will accept nothing. He urged him to to accept, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let two mule loads of earth be given to your servant, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god except the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So if we skip ahead a little bit in in the story of Scripture and we come to the Gospels and, and, of course, to Jesus, once we read, Jesus went and preached at his hometown synagogue in Capernaum. And when he was preaching, he told this story that I've just read from 2 Kings. He told this story about Naaman. Jesus said, look, there were many lepers in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha. None of them were cleansed, but Naaman the Syrian was healed. Now, when Jesus was preaching this, this was, this was difficult. These were difficult words from Jesus in this Uh, sermon in this preaching to the hometown synagogue crowd. See, 
Naaman wasn't just a Gentile, that is, a non-Jewish person. He was literally an Aramean military hero. During Elisha's lifetime, the Arameans were the greatest military threat to all of Israel. If you think about it, it might be something akin to a, a colonial pastor in those original 13 uh, colonies of America helping a British war general during the American War of Independence. Or you might even just think about Jesus and, and Jesus' ministry to the Roman centurions, those Roman uh, military officers. But here, Jesus told this story to his hometown synagogue in Capernaum, and those good church people got angry. They got really angry at Jesus. They rose up, right? They grabbed Jesus by the collar. They ran him out of the synagogue. They literally ran him out of town. They hauled him all the way to the crest of a hill, and they tried to throw him off this edge of a cliff. Somehow Jesus was able to sort of pass through the crowd and then continue on his way. But the thing is this. God is always reaching out to outsiders, to Gentiles, to foreigners, to strangers, to people outside the church, to the marginalized. And in doing so, God continues to offer grace and healing and blessing to them. Now, Naaman, he thought he was this big, important dude. And he had a big attitude that went along with that. I mean, he's introduced at the beginning of our our text in these sort of exalted terms. He was commander of the army. <laughs> he was a great man. He was highly honored. He was decorated with many, many victories. But he was a leper. I mean, in all his greatness, with everything that he had accomplished, he had this blight, this problem. He was still excluded he was unclean. Now, might help, Old Testament leprosy, when we talk about this, it's not really the same thing as what we talk about as Hansen's disease today, the modern form of leprosy. It was a skin disorder. There was probably flaking skin, discoloration, etc. But it wasn't so much a physical malady as it was this sort of symbolic disability. But Naaman, he was the commander of the Aramean army. Now, on one of their, on one of their uh, guerrilla warfare raids into Israel, they had taken captive a young Israeli girl, and she was then made to be a servant for Naaman's wife. This is kind of an interesting thing, and I'm sure we don't quite understand this, but even after being kidnapped and forced into servitude, maybe you'd even consider it slavery, um, this young Israeli girl, she still wanted to help. She wanted to help Naaman and his wife. And so she told them about seeing the prophet Elisha, who could heal the leprosy. Now, in, in this story, pay attention to the servants. We always want to be watching the servants in this story. They play this sort of vital role in the unfolding drama. And we heard this last week, how we're all called to be servants. We're all called to step up and to serve. And then, of course, Jesus says the same thing to all of us who are, are following in the way of Jesus. We are to serve. We are to be servants. But here we see servants can have great influence. So Naaman's king, who's the king of Aram, sent a letter along with Naaman to the king of Israel, along with a bunch of money, asking him to heal Naaman. And this scared the king of Israel. He knew he couldn't heal someone who had leprosy. Only God can heal, and so he panicked. The king of Israel here um, in these stories, he's really just the most negative character in the story. I mean, he just cannot conceive of God being active beyond the boundaries of Israel. He, he can't believe that this is a sincere request from the, the king of Aram on behalf of this great military hero, Naaman, he simply thought the Aramean king was picking a fight, trying to look for a way, for an excuse to then come and make war on them. Well, you couldn't heal my guy, so I'm going to come and, and make war on you. But Elisha the prophet, he said, let him come to me. 
Let him come to me so that he may learn that there really is this true prophet of the Lord God in Israel. So Naaman's caravan, the whole crowd, they went over to Elisha and waited at the door. Now we know Naaman was a great man, right? He's a great man. He expected great things to be done for him. And so I think he had this expectation that Elisha would come and stand before him as his servant. But of course, Elisha, Elisha isn't Naaman's servant. Elisha is a servant of the Lord God, of Yahweh. So Elisha just sent a messenger out to Naaman to tell him to do something ridiculous. Go wash in the Jordan River seven times. But if he did this, he'd be made clean and whole and fresh. And Naaman, the great man, was angry. He was looking for a miracle, right? He was looking for something spectacular to happen. He thought Elisha should come to him because he was such an important person. Of course, this is an honor-shame culture. Someone who has even more honor, someone with less honor, should come and bow before them and do this obeisance kind of a thing. And he's looking for spectacle, right? He wanted to show, he wanted Elisha to wave his hand, abracadabra, and do this sort of spectacular thing for him with the leprosy. And that didn't happen, and he got angry, his proud feelings were hurt, and he stormed off in a rage. Here we go. Watch the servants again, right? First, there was the little servant girl, the Israeli uh, servant girl, but now Naaman's own servants went after him. He's still ticked off, he's fuming. They approached him and gently said, if the prophet had, had told you to do something spectacular, wouldn't you have done that? This simple thing, just a simple thing. Won't you do this little thing, this simple thing too? And Naaman said, look, I hear you. I appreciate your concern. But this is silly, dipping myself in this this river here in Israel. It's stupid. How can this river water do such a wonder? Of course, we talk about being dipped in the river. Um, we start to think about baptism. This is a good example of baptism, of being dipped in the water. And of course, in the world's eyes, baptism is perhaps ludicrous, ridiculous. I mean, it's just water. How can water do such wonders? And of course, when we talk about baptism, we'd say, yeah, it is ordinary water, but it's not just ordinary water. It is ordinary water to which God's Word and the Holy Spirit have been added. God does do extraordinary wonders with ordinary things like water and like bread and juice. Of course, it makes no sense to us smart, modern people. Here, water is just, it's too simple. But of course, that's kind of the point. Baptism is a bit of an insult to the wisdom of the world. But through the foolishness of water, God has chosen to save those who believe, those who are dipped in the water. Naaman, the great man, had to let go of his attitude, his control, his importance. He had to become small and humble and allow himself to be dipped in the water. In 2004, uh, I was starting a new church on the southeast side of Des Moines in the Easter Lake uh, area. And, and I'd connected with this couple and I I, I married them. It was a wonderful outdoor ceremony over at Gray's Lake. And three years later, uh, they asked me to come to their home. I went to their home and I prayed with them. Their little 14-month-old daughter, Maya, was born with an abnormal heart and 
they were leaving Des Moines the next morning to take Maya to the University of Iowa Hospital. And the doctors there were, they were going to open her up and take her heart out and try and rebuild it. Now, Maya's parents love her very, very much, of course. And, and you know, if they could trade places with her, this is what parents do. This is how parents feel, right? If only, if only they could just trade places with her, they would. They would take her suffering upon themselves in a moment, without hesitation, in an instant. But they couldn't. They were powerless. And her, and her mom, Maya's mom said, look, there's nothing that we can do. We, we see this now. There's nothing we can do but pray and hope. All they could do was let go of, of that control they were trying to hang on to, which is really just an illusion, right? It's the illusion of control. And, and humble themselves before God and then just commend their daughter to God's love and, and care. To literally kind of just say to the Lord, we're placing this child that we love in your hands, God. That little girl is, is doing well today. At the time, of course, they didn't know how things were going to turn out. And of course, many of you have experienced this in your own lives as well. There are moments when you realize you simply are not in control or you, or you recognize there's this illusion of control. And it's in those moments when we acknowledge that the only thing we can do is commend ourselves and commend the ones that we love into God's hands, into God's love and, and, and care and grace and healing. We have to let go and let God, as, as the saying is. We, we let go and we let God. And so for Naaman and for, for you and for me, for confident, controlling people, Faith and healing can often involve becoming small and humbling ourselves and surrendering this illusion of control and taking a bath in strange waters. Naaman did that. He relented. He let, he let go of that control. He relented and he was healed by doing what the prophet had it instructed him to do. Now, his own king couldn't heal him. And even though the, the little servant girl from Israel wanted him to go see the prophet, Elisha, Naaman's king, sent him with a letter to the king of Israel. I mean, Naaman's king couldn't heal him, but the king of Israel couldn't heal him either. Kings are impotent compared to the power of Yahweh that is spoken through, spoken through the prophet and spoken through God's people. And after Naaman was healed again, he went back to the prophet Elisha, and now he humbled himself and stood before the prophet. It's this amazing uh, turnaround. And he wanted to pay Elisha for healing him. But you see, God's grace has already been paid for. It comes to us without any cost. Elisha won't accept any payment. God's grace, God's healing, God's peace, the wholeness and completeness of life, health and well-being and joy and beauty and justice and friendship and salvation, that is freely given and freely received. And that's what it is for us in the church today as well. God's grace and healing and peace is freely given and freely received. It doesn't cost us anything. Now, sure, we financially support uh, the ministry of our church and, and even now the, we financially support the, the cost of the building project for this new ministry center and all that, right? But all of that, all the, the financial support that we give is simply done in response. It's given in this sort of gratitude and this joy as a response to what God has done for us freely, what God would do for us, whether we did anything or not, because we have not earned it. We, we don't deserve it. We don't work for it, right? We don't pay for it. It's just freely given. So Elisha wouldn't accept any payment for God's healing and grace. Naaman, he, he wanted to take two, two loads of dirt back home with him. And this is interesting. Even though he knew, 
he knew that the Lord God Yahweh is God over the whole earth. He wanted his two loads of holy land, literally holy land, right? The dirt becomes this sort of tangible thing to, to hang on to. It's a reminder. You know, even today, sometimes when we go and, and visit the Holy Land, um, sometimes people will bring back a little jar of water from the Jordan River or some of the land that they've scooped up and put into some kind of a container, right? Uh, maybe from one of the special uh, locations over there. We even do that today. There's this sort of tangible thing. But the point is this. For Naaman, he wanted to take these two these two loads of earth back with him because he became a worshiper of the Lord God. There is no other God, only the Lord God, Yahweh. And that is who Naaman would worship from that day moving forward. And of course, God is Lord over all of creation, over the entire cosmos, you might say. God is active in the cosmos, in this creation, far beyond the boundaries that we set up as God's people. And one of the ways God's activity comes into clear focus is through the people of God, through, through the servant girl and through the prophet Elijah, and of course, now through us. You see, when the Lord God called Abraham, and we go all the way back uh, into the book of Genesis for the, the beginning, the formation of God's people, right? And, and when the Lord God called Abraham, and that's the, the family line that we're in here, God said, hey, go from this country, this land that you know, you and your family, and, and go to the land that I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation that will bless all the other families of the earth. You will be a blessing to the rest of the earth. This is what the Lord God instructed Abraham. Now, our story today um, uh, that we're reading in, in 2 Kings is a wonderful example of just that, of, of Israel bringing blessing to the nations. The people of God are, a, are to be a blessing to others and to others in the world, bringing that, that grace and that healing, that peace, that, that shalom, the wholeness and completeness of life, the health and well-being and joy and beauty and, and justice and friendship and, and salvation. And of course, that's what our story is about because we are grafted uh, as, as Gentile people, most of us, right? We're grafted into that story of God's people that we receive in, in our holy scriptures. And so that story that goes all the way back to Abraham is our story as well. That's what we are called to do and that's what our church is called to do. And, and, you know, we're in the midst of a lot happening, right? Soon we're going we're gonna to be moving to a, a new location there on, on L.A. Grant Parkway. It's cool. We're seeing the building now sort of take uh, a dimension. It's, it's going vertical, becoming three-dimensional for us, coming off the ground. And in that new location, we'll be in the midst of, of these new, newer neighborhoods all around. And, and even, even without going to our new location, all of us who are a part of the church, we all live in places where there are people, where there are neighborhoods you know, around us. So we already have neighborhoods. We are God's people. Whether we are, are standing uh, in our own home on our front porch or standing in the street talking to our neighbors or whether we're gathering together um, soon in our, our new location on L.A. Grant Parkway at the new ministry center, right? We are God's people and we are called to be a blessing, to bring blessing, healing, and grace to all people, to bring that to others. So we bring blessing to our neighbors. And, and even those neighbors that we think might be against us, I mean, that's kind of this amazing thing, right? I mean, here's Naaman, a, a military hero for the greatest military threat against the Israelites in that time of Elisha. And so we as God's people, we're called to even bless the people that we think might even be a threat to us. We're to bring healing and blessing God's peace, the wholeness and complete. Can you think of that? Think about people that, can you imagine anybody that you think might even be against us? And then think about how we love and care and, and, and treat them so that they receive this blessing and this grace and this healing, this peace of God, the wholeness and completeness of life, the health and well-being and joy and beauty and, and justice and friendship and, and salvation. And we do all of that without cost. We do this because we are servants of the Lord God. 
we don't do this in order to get something out of people. Whether we might think of, you know, getting more members or getting more offering or something. No, 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 no. God's grace has already been paid for by the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. We do this so that others will know that the Lord is God and will worship the Lord God Almighty and, and, and join us in that. We'll become a part of that with us. Now, the rest of this chapter that, that we've started reading here today, 2 Kings uh, chapter 5, that shows us what happens when we do try to get something from people when we give God's grace. So here we see another servant again. We've watched the young Israeli servant girl. She wanted to help. Uh, she wanted to help Naaman. We've seen Naaman's servants gently turn him to humble himself and be baptized to be dipped in the Jordan River, right? But now we see Gehazi. And Gehazi is the servant of Elisha. And at the end of this story that we're reading, he tried to get something out of Naaman. All right, so, right, Elisha wouldn't accept anything. God's grace, God's healing, that's just, that's given for free. It's already, already been provided for. And Na Naaman had just left. And Gehazi thought, <laughs> that Aramean, you can put any number of persons or groups <laughs> into that phrase, but here for Gehazi, it was that Aramean. Mm, that Aramean should have paid for the healing. So Gehazi took it upon himself and ran after Naaman and his caravan. Now, Naaman saw him running after them. He jumped down from his chariot. He ran back to meet him. He was concerned that everything was okay. And Gehazi said, well, yeah, 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 everything's okay, but, and then he made up this story about, about two prophets in training just showing up and, and needing some money and clothes. And he said that Elisha had sent him to ask for something, just a little something after all. Complete fabrication. It was all a lie. But Naaman, he hears this and he says, of course, you notice this, when we receive this grace and healing from God, we immediately become generous in sharing with others and giving um, to others without any thought, right? And so Naomi, he said, of course, and he gave far more than was asked. He even sent two servants along in order to carry it all. But when they got close, Gehazi, he took the bags of money and the clothes and he sent Naaman's servants away. And then he went and he hid the bags and then finally he went back inside, where Elisha asked him, Gehazi, where have you been? And Gehazi lied. He said, um, nowhere. I haven't gone anywhere. But you see, you can't lie to a, a true prophet of God. And Elisha said, is this the time to accept money? Is this the time to get something from others for the grace of God that was freely given? No. And then Elisha pronounced something terrible. He, he said to Gehazi, therefore, because you have done this, the leprosy that did cling to Naaman before he was just healed will now cling to you. And that's what happened. That's what happened when someone tried to get something. When God's grace and healing is given for free, when someone tried to capitalize on that, that person then became diseased, became sick. When we see people as commodities, as just people who have this financial value to us, when we try to get something from people for God's grace, then we end up diseased ourselves. 
as the people of Abraham, Israel, and now the church, and that includes all of us, right? We are to be a blessing to the nations. The people of God, we were a part of that, right? We are a blessing to others in the world, bringing God's, God's grace, God's healing, God's peace, that biblical word shalom, right? And we do this without cost. We do it because we are servants of the Lord God, servants of Jesus. We don't do this in order to get something out of people. We don't, we don't ever offer this so that we can you know, get more members or bigger offerings or, or anything like that. That stuff all just takes care of itself when we just live as disciples of Jesus, as, as literally the people who embody God's grace and, and healing and God's peace in the world and, and, and sharing that with others. All the rest of the stuff takes care of itself. See, God's grace has already been paid for by the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. And, and so we do all that we can to be a blessing to others so that they will know that the Lord is God and will join us in worshiping the Lord God Almighty. Thanks be to God.